This is Dr. Baba Kazizadeh. You are listening to the Smile Podcast, where I will be sharing with you my unique and holistic perspective on beauty, health, and wellness. Hello. <laughs> Millions of people have surgery every year. Or you could just get a boob job. Using targeted Botox can be a miracle. Smiling like that is a skill. Your there. surgery has been successful. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smile Podcast. Uh, I'm Dr. Babak Azizadeh, and I'm so honored and excited to have Dr. Hazeltine with us today. Uh, for uh, usually, we jump right into our discussions, but I, you know, Dr. Hazeltine's just uh, history is so remarkable. So I wanted to let the audience and the viewers know about him a little bit. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, I would call based on kind of all the things that I've, I've read and heard, he's a really a modern Renaissance man. He's world renowned scientist. Then he went on to become a, a amazing entrepreneur in the biotech space. And he's a philanthropist and an author of a very new book that I think will be really exciting for everyone to look at the family guide to COVID, which I think this has been a very difficult issue to discuss with our kids and, you know, I have teenagers at home. So um, he's also the chair and president of the Access Health International and the Hazeltine Foundation for Science and Arts. He's been, you know, Time Magazine's world, you know, 25 most influential uh, business people and more importantly, Scientific American, which is what I used to read in college, before I started studying, he was considered one of the top 100 most influential biotech. Um, you know, he started two departments at Harvard and has started multiple, okay, enough. Let's multiple biotech. Yeah. So <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Dr. Hazeltine. We're really excited to have you. Thank you. And thank you for the generous introduction. Okay. So I'm going to get into, we're going to talk, you know, this is, I consider, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of lay people that don't understand the scientific uh, background of uh, COVID that are, you know, laying out guidelines and so forth. So I want to get a little bit more into, you know, your, your analysis of this scientific data out there. But the first thing I'd like to do is really, you were at the forefront of the HIV battle. And what do you see as similarities and differences between HIV and COVID um, and kind of what we can learn from our, you know, from, you know, our experience and history? Well, let me just begin with a, uh, a description that might help people understand COVID a little better. Uh, and then we'll do some of the comparisons. Wonderful. Uh, COVID is a cold virus with a very nasty habit. That's the way you should think about it. And to take you further back, that's what polio virus was too. Mm. Most people don't remember, but I was a kid and I remember part of it. And that is that polio only paralyzed one out of 200 people that it infected and killed one out of 2,000 people it infected. But it gave a lot of other people colds. It's a coronavirus, it's a cold virus. There's Hundreds of coronaviruses that give you colds. So in a way, we know and have experienced, we know about these viruses. So if you want to think about transmission, yeah. think about how you catch a cold. Your kid goes to school and comes back and gives you a cold. My grandkids go to school, they come back, they give me a cold. People give colds to each other. There's all nothing, the all the time. And these are called coronaviruses. And about 60 years ago, people first noticing these funny kind of spiky viruses, they call them coronaviruses, and we've been tracking them, these cold viruses, for 60 years. Now, each virus has its own way of living. You have to think of it as living creatures that are trying to live in the environment. The only problem with that is we're the environment. We humans are their environment. Right. Yeah, we're their, we're their ecological niche. So there's a whole bunch of viruses they, that come, you make a good immune response, you shut them down, and you're protected for life. Those are things like polio, measles, mumps, chicken pox. And there's something in common to all of those, which is they infect kids. Why? Because once you get them as a kid, you never get them again. Yeah. Those viruses depend upon 
us having babies. That's our ecological niche, our young. And we're trying to shut them all down and we're doing a pretty good job. There's other viruses like HIV. They have a completely different way of working. They rely on adult behavior, our need to get together to reproduce. And that's how they're transmitted. And they get into you and you can never get rid of them. They're hard to get. You don't get them by being next to somebody. I remember helping Princess Diana destigmatize it by holding an AIDS baby. That did more for HIV. I remember that. Than anything else. We worked, I was part of an organization, the AIDS Crisis Trust in Great Britain. She was the patron. And finally, we got her to hug an AIDS guy and hold an AIDS baby. And that made an enormous difference in destigmatizing it. But you don't get AIDS that way. That's not how you got the virus. And then there's the flu virus that everybody knows about. Well, it's a tr tricky guy because you get it, you become immune, but it goes off, changes its clothes, puts on hats and gloves and glasses, raincoat, and comes back and gets you again. Coronaviruses are even trickier. And that's something you have to remember. Now, everybody knows you get a cold every year. In fact, on average, people get three or four colds. And every year, you're getting the same coronaviruses. They don't have to disguise themselves because they have another trick. Get it and forget it. They get into you, you make an immune response, and for somehow, and we're trying to figure this out, they mess around with your immune system so you just forget it and yeah. they come right back. Well, what does that mean? That means that this huge epidemic that we're going through is the first of many from the same virus unless we learn how to control it. Those people who are infected are very likely a year from now to be reinfected. There's a paper that I just came across my desk today that's a definitive study of showing how the virus concentration of antibodies declines. We knew it was happening from some earlier studies from China because they've had it longer than we've had, but the same antibodies that are protecting you and clearing the virus disappear and these viruses can come right back. And that's why these same coronaviruses that we saw 60 years ago are still around, still giving us colds. So the big picture is think of this as a cold virus with a very nasty habit. You know how cold viruses are transmitted. And unfortunately, these make 20% of the people so sick. Really sick. They have to go to the hospital. So let me give you some other numbers. You know, you hear somebody say, well, 99% of people don't get anything. That is not true. What the numbers are, if you look all over the world, and this is an average, and they, somebody got to argue a little bit around the edges, but on average, 20% of people get infected. Don't even know they've been infected. Yeah. That's called asymptomatic. However, if you actually look at their lungs through x-rays, which people have now begun to do, 60% of them have lung damage. In one, and 30% have lung damage in both lungs. So they may not know they've been hit, but they've been hit, okay? And they can transmit the virus. So then the others get some kind of symptoms. That's 80% of people get some symptoms. Now for about 60% of those, so a total of 80% get mild symptoms. They get a cold, it is a cold virus. They get a cold, they get running noses, they may get headaches, they can't smell very well. Uh, they may get diarrhea. Everybody talks about this as a virus that gets your lungs and your nose. It also gets your gut. And one of the early symptoms is diarrhea. Let me tell you a consequence of that that most people don't think about. That means sewage is contaminated. That means water that gets sewage in it can give you COVID. That means sewer gas can give you COVID. Because people poop out, the virus is there. The virus can come wafting up in the sewer gas and has, in fact, for SARS, done that. So we don't pay attention to that, but the Chinese have been rigorous. And they, if they know you're infected, they give you medicines to disinfect your feces before you flush the toilet because they want to clear the sewers out. So that's a whole nother issue. So just for parents, you don't want to go swimming in the sea when there's a coli alert. You know, I, at Jones Beach in New York, three or four times a summer. Don't go into the water, there's too much E. coli. There was runoff from the sewers. There was a big flood or uh, something came through. There's coli, in there. if there's coli in there, there's gonna be COVID in there. You gotta be careful. So that's sort of a big picture. 
of what people should think about. It's not a mystery to us who are virologists. We know about these viruses. There is still a mystery about how it does all the damage it does to us. Because I say this is a cold virus with a really nasty habit. And we're trying to understand all the things that it can do. And every day we're finding new nasties that this can do. This is a really serious disease. So people don't think it's a serious disease. And then we go through. So about 20% of people who get it have to go to a hospital. Yeah. And why do you go to a hospital? Your fever is over 104 as an adult. That's, That's tough bad. stuff. Yeah. And 105, 106, you're dead. You get rapid heat death. You know, your body just burns itself up at 106. So 104 and a half is pretty serious. Or you don't have enough oxygen. And I have recommended everybody have at home a, a pulse oximeter. It doesn't cost very much. You put it on your finger. It says below 94, uh-uh, go to the hospital. Yeah. You may even not know you're sick, but your body knows you're sick. So that's the two reasons you go to the hospital. Super high fevers or you can't breathe very well, or, or you can't think you're breathing well, but your pulse oximeter says you're not. And so 20% go to the hospital, and maybe a third or more of those have to go to the ICU, and about half of those never make it out of the ICU today. So that's about the right numbers to think about. Uh, overall, in terms of fatality, it depends where you are, depends what your underlying condition is, uh, I was just learning that there is a new association with some genetic markers that predicts yeah. uh, whether you're going to end up in an ICU and how serious it's going to be. But that's generally the overall picture. I hope that's helpful for you. I think that's amazing because, again, not that I think people are doing it you know, on purpose, but I think the information, it's so new and so much has happened in such a short period of time. And I think there is misinformation out there. So people don't truly understand all the details that you just provided for us because they don't know how to analyze the data. And someone like yourself with your background understands how to analyze the data and truly kind of put information out there that we can use you know, in our day-to-day -day lives and understand it so that you know, kind of the healthcare uh, community can also better battle mm -hmm. this. So it, Two questions just came up, you know, why is it, I've looked at the death rates, like for instance, in California versus New York, why was it, why is the death rates of the hospitalized patients different in different areas? And I don't know if it's right or not, maybe you could tell me, it seems like the overall death rates now and the treatments are better. So can you kind of give us some light into that? Sure. In those two phenomenons. Yeah. The, whether you die from this infection, the first reason is who you are and what your health history has been. And if you have a very good health history, the chance that you're going to die is not zero. People I know actually. No, there have been healthy people. Very healthy people who have died. So there are some, this is going to get some people, and we're trying to understand that by looking at inheritance and other factors. But most of the people who die have some other problem. First problem is they're old. That's, and when you're old, your immune system doesn't work very well. That's the first thing. When, but also it's age combined with an underlying problem, like you're fat. People call it obesity, but fat is the right word for it. And if your body mass index is over 30, which a lot of Americans is, yeah. you're at much higher risk of dying. Why is that? Because fat is a tissue that does things. It's not just sitting there. It actually conditions your body to, to be inflamed. You know, if you cut yourself and you look at that area around the cut, it's all red and angry. Well, think of your body as somewhere along that spectrum, your whole body. And this virus just puts extra stress on that. If you have an underlying lung condition, you can't breathe very well to begin with. Mm. This compromises that. This virus infects and attacks the heart. So if you have heart disease, you can also be succumbed more easily. The virus uh, affects people with diabetes. Why? Because diabetes also is a general, in many cases, inflammatory reaction. So your body is already stressed. So this is a hyper stress. 
Uh, and so there, those under those, those are the main reasons. So when you're talking about different areas, California, you have to actually differentiate what parts of California too, because it's not uniform. And we all know that parts of our population are much less healthy than others. Let me just give you something to think about. It's a big field that's come up in the last 10 years called social determinants of health. Where you live, how rich you are, what access you have to healthcare, what you eat as your diet, determine 80% of your health. And this is no different from this infection. If you go from the shore of Chicago west, the lake, you go west, every four or five blocks, you drop three or four years in life expectancy. So the time you're 20 blocks away, three or four subway stops from the excellent hospitals, you live on average 20 years shorter. So when the virus infects that population, it's no wonder that more of those people die. Who are those people? They're recent immigrants. That's who they are. They haven't established a lifestyle yet. Their children will. Their grandchildren will. They'll be fully Americans and integrated. They'll be our doctors, our lawyers, our business people. They'll be doing just fine. But that's not their I'm one of those, by the way. <laughs> okay, there you are. Well, you're doing just fine. Okay? And you're, if you get infected with COVID, you've got a pretty good chance, right? But they don't because they have a lot of underlying disease. So that's really the determinant of, of what the outcomes are. It's underlying disease plus age. Wow. So the, the concept of, um, you know, kind of there are different strains you don't believe, you think it's just still the same strain that maybe started in Wuhan that has kind of gone around the globe. And has that's a very interesting created. question. Uh, and and it, actually, there is some strain variation, but not the ones you mentioned. Um, it looks like in sometime in February, a, the virus mutated and became more infectious. Yeah. Not more lethal, but more infectious. And actually, one of the students of my students, so I'm old enough to have grand students now, I love it. Uh, is studying, studied that he and his wife are both my grand students, okay? And they, uh, there was epidemiologists who noticed that this particular strain, this one change, was spreading very rapidly. So the, the way it looks like now is the original virus from Wuhan wasn't as infectious as the strain that's currently spreading. It got into Europe, and somewhere in Europe in February, it mutated and took over most of Europe, went back to China, took over most of China, and has taken off of most of the US. Now let's take a, a, a smaller microcosm. Look at Chicago. In January, mid-January, a traveler went from Wuhan to Chicago and brought the virus. That virus came into the US very early, but was the original Wuhan strain, and now even in Chicago is only 8% of the strains. The next thing that happened is somebody came into Washington state infected, there was a change in the virus, and about 20% of what's in Chicago is that virus. The rest is all New York, the strain that came from Europe into New York, and that's what's spreading. Now, as I say, the good news is it doesn't seem that it's more lethal, causes any different diseases, but it takes probably a lot less virus. So the spread that we're seeing in the United States today, the spread we're seeing all through South America and other places, is because this virus is more efficient. And we know biochemically exactly what it does. It allows the virus particle to keep more of the spikes that can grab onto cells. So it takes a virus with more spikes can right, grab onto your cells better than a virus with fewer spikes. And it does. And so that's the change. But it, I don't think the difference that you're seeing in response to infection is a different virus strain so much as it is the underlying health condition of those people who get it. So I know you've written a lot about kind of vaccine versus therapeutic treatments and also change of treatments that have happened just in the very short time. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you think 
you know, um, you know, you, you were, again, you know, ha have been doing this for a long time. So you've seen it all. You've seen the drug developments, you've run biopharmaceutical companies. And so this has been an unprecedented time, it seems like, you know, the mobilization of the government in terms of trying to find a drug and funding drug companies. So what are your thoughts on, you know, the, the vaccine versus therapeutic treatment? What's going well, to- let, let me just say, let's talk about therapy for the moment. Uh, for somebody with a, a mild case of this, there's not much to do except what you do for a cold. You go to your local pharmacy or you call them up and say, give me cold medicines. Yeah. And that's what you do. Uh, and you call your doctor or your hotline, whatever you do, and you stay in touch with them. If you want, you get tested. But if you're in the hospital, then it's out of your hands. It's in the doctor's hands. And one of the great things that I see is all around the world, people are working like crazy to improve outcomes. The people in early days in Wuhan and other parts of China had a 90% chance of dying once they went into the ICU, 90%. Well, that's a lot better now in a good hospital in most parts of the world, it's down to 20%. That's a huge change. Amazing. Anybody who's taking care of a patient, you get a 90% dying versus 20% of coming out alive is a good outcome. And why is that? Because they've learned using the tools that they had and the tools we already have in our hands, not any new tools, learning how to use those better. That's the job. Of, uh, and we're exchanging information globally like never before. People are publishing everything they find. So what can you do now? First is very simple, just process. You flip people over onto their stomach. So it turns out, you breathe a lot better whether you're on your, on, your back, on your stomach than on your back because just the way your anatomy goes, you get deeper, you get more access to the deep recesses of your lung. That actually saved a lot of people. Also, learning how to get people out of the ICU faster. Being in the ICU intubated is a really bad thing because you are fundamentally paralyzed. When you're intubated, you are given a paralytic drug, Curare, and you can't move. And not moving for more than two or three days is enough to stress your body almost to death. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they've learned to move people through, yeah. right? And get them into step-down facilities. That may seem like a little deal, but it could be your life. Then people notice that it isn't just a lung disease. It's a, now called a multi-system disease. This virus attacks your lung, your heart, your kidney, your uh, pancreas, your brain. They're now on the alert for many of these things, particularly coagulation. You, a lot of death occur from a stroke, a heart attack, lung emboli, kidney disease. Other deaths occur from kidney failure, which is maybe direct, maybe indirect, or both. So once you're alert to those things, you know to measure and very carefully monitor insulin levels and sugar levels, and you start treating people in, while well, they're intubated yeah. for dialysis, and that saves lives. Uh, but the anticoagulants had made a huge difference to saving people's lives. Now, you got to be careful because some people get hemorrhagic strokes. They get bleeding. You get uh, ischemic strokes, and you get hemorrhagic strokes from all the clots that are thrown off. So you got to be really careful. But that's made a big difference. Then there are a few other drugs, uh, uh, interferon and ribavirin, together with some other combinations, uh, have made a difference. There is a new drug that has just been approved uh, yesterday or the day before in India uh, for a um, anti-cytokine storm drug. We don't know, it's, it was a tiny, tiny little study, but it was enough to convince the Indians that this drug it had a very interesting history. I've actually followed this history. It was invented in Cuba, okay, invented in Cuba for arthritis, picked up by an Indian company, used for a series of, uh, different diseases and approved, and now has been tested for COVID. So who knows? Uh, but we're getting better and better in getting people to survive. That's uh, so that's part of the, the story. So that isn't what you asked me about vaccines versus drugs, but it's really relevant to anybody who's got a friend or a relative or themselves gets ill enough to have to go to the hospital. And vaccines, that's like all anyone can think of right. but you brought about and talked about one thing that i think worries you know kind of i, I consider myself a little bit of a layperson in this process 
I was a microbiology and molecular genetics major undergrad, so I know just enough to be, I guess, dangerous about my knowledge base for this. But you brought, brought uh, talked about something that the coronavirus is, we don't get long lasting immunity. And so what are your thoughts about, are the vaccines going to be the type of vaccine that we're going to need to get shots every three to four months to really keep ourselves safe from this? Or is it going to be even effective? Uh, you no. know. Well, I think the first question for vaccine is even more fundamental. Is it safe? Yeah. Okay. You know, I, can, I think most people would be willing, like the flu viruses, to say, okay, I'll take the vaccine, even if it's not going to work perfectly. But it's not going to hurt me. Yeah. Safety is a number one thing because you're giving vaccines to totally healthy people. It's really different from, you know, you're on death's door, I'm going to give you whatever drug. And if it gives you a nasty side effect, you end up purple. At least you're alive, right? And there are drugs that actually do change your color. So I'm not just making it <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. So uh, and you would take it to live, even if you ended up purple for the rest of your life. So... Um, that's the first question that worries me. When you rush a vaccine through yeah. for rushing it, do you have time to look at what it's going to do to you in a year? Absolutely not, if you're going to develop it in six months. How many people do you have to test it on to know that it's safe to give to a billion people? How many old people do you have to give it to to make sure that it's safe for them? Because old people need a lot more vaccine because they don't react very well. Yeah. And you've got to use a lot stronger adjuvants and a lot of old people are fragile. So the safety issue is the one that is number one in my mind. Personally, I could tolerate a vaccine which is partially effective as long as it was safe. Okay, I'm afraid we're gonna get approval because there's such an economic and political pressure, not only in our country, it's not everywhere. just our country, yeah. it's everywhere that we're gonna get emergency youth authorizations, we're gonna get partial approvals, we're get some kind of use of these vaccines before we know that they're fully effective and before we know they're safe. And safety to me comes first. Yeah, I mean, I think- So I think that is the answer when people ask me, are we gonna have a vaccine? My answer is almost certainly yes. I can tell by reading the news, right? If you tell me, ask me a question, is it gonna be safe? I'm going to say you, you don't, you're not going to know. And the second question is it effective, maybe partially, because we already know something about most of the vaccines. They don't protect against infection. They may protect against some of the diseases, but we don't know that because we don't have a good animal model for disease. So that's a longer answer, but the, the, the answer is we're very likely to have a vaccine. We're not going to know its full safety profile and we're, very likely to have one that is partially effective, if effective at all. In answer to your question, how often you're gonna get it, gonna need it, we need a flu vaccine every year. Nobody knows yet whether natural infections are gonna be different from vaccines. I can tell you from observing lots and lots of vaccines being developed, if your body is really good at making it and protecting your body for life, then you got a good chance at a vaccine. If your body isn't naturally good at that, which ours is not, we forget we've been infected, you don't have such a good chance. And if the virus has learned to live with you forever, you have almost zero chance. Yeah. Okay, so this is somewhere in between, hey, we got a great chance, and no, we have no chance at all. It's somewhere in the middle there. So what does the middle mean? It means uncertainty. We just have to wait to see. Um, now, you asked me drugs versus vaccines, okay? I realized early on that we weren't gonna have a vaccine for HIV, at least not in the near future. Why? Because a vaccine isn't a shield that protects it from getting in, it's a rapid response. It's in you and you can get rid of it quickly. What we learned about the AIDS virus is that once it gets in, it never gets out. And because vaccines don't prevent it from getting in, the game was over. Yeah. That was very obvious. It wasn't obvious to everybody who booed me off the stage the first time I said that. I'm That's sure it was tomatoes and they hooked me off. It was, yeah. people were very unhappy to hear that. But there is something we could do. 
short of vaccine. And that is treat people so they don't die and they live a normal life. And we're very close to doing that today. And there's something else we can do once we have drugs that are relatively safe is we can prevent people who are exposed from being infected. The very first drug we had, AZT, not only was it approved to treat people who were infected, it was treat, used to treat healthcare workers who accidentally infected Got themselves. Needle. Yeah. needle sticks. That was prophylaxis. Right away, AZT was approved from that. And then it took some doing. We had to show that AZT stopped mothers transmitting the virus to their infants in monkeys. Once we'd show that, people were willing to do it in humans. And now the drugs had stopped maternal child transmission. They reduced it almost to zero. In fact, so low, you can't even measure it. So that's as close to zero as you can get, not measurable. And now we have drugs that are safe enough to use for people who have a lower risk of exposure. Maybe they have a lifestyle that's going to expose them. But if they take these drugs called pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's very unlikely they'll get infected. And it used to be a daily pill, but we're right on the brink of a every two months to every six months to every eight months shot. That's long-term exposure, and it's kind of like a mini vaccine. Now, the good thing about the coronaviruses is that we have a lot of experience in developing those drugs already. Not against this one, but against their predecessors, the SARS and MERS. And we know those drugs work. We know we can get drugs that are very specific, highly potent, and safe, at least in animals. And those are being rushed forward, whether they're monoclonal antibodies or whether they're protease inhibitors, helicase inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors, they're being rushed forward. And I am very confident that those are gonna work. In fact, the same chemicals that work against SARS and MERS, the very same ones stop this virus too. And people are busy sort of modifying around the corners so they get patents on them. But yeah. other than that, these are, going to, these are going to work. And so if we don't get a safe and effective vaccine soon, these will be a bridge. And how are those going to be used? Those are going to be used to protect people who are likely to get infected, healthcare workers. You know, if you look around the world, healthcare workers are two or three times oh, yeah. more likely to be infected than any other group. The guys who drive the ambulances, that pick up the people from their homes, the people in the emergency rooms, the doctors who are treating you, the people who are in the ICUs and doing intubation, their risk is very high. So the first use will be for healthcare workers. Second use will be for household members. Third use will be for people who've been contact traced. Those can prevent you from being infected or in early stages of infection, We'll probably treat you. Now, treating this disease early is very different from treating it late. By the time the late symptoms come along that are likely to kill you, it's too late to do virus treatment. You can hardly find the virus there. It's done, it's damaged, and your body is, you know, think of, uh, think of it, you've been in a terrible car crash. Yeah, no, you're you hit. It's not, you, you survived, but you have so much damage all over your body that maybe you're going to live or, or die, or maybe be burned over a third of your body with a third degree burn. The damage is done. It's not going to help to put out a fire. Now you're doing things to try to save somebody. That's what the two different changes are like. There's an early phase before infection, early infection. But once this thing gets rolling and your body has started reacting in all these different ways, then you need a whole different kind of, of treatment. That's where the dexamethasones, the anticoagulants, the other drugs uh, come in. Yeah, it's kind of like a radiation damage after a nuclear, you know, nuclear accident. Or uh, I can say as a cancer survivor after radiation therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm still dealing with the long-term radiation oh, yeah. effects, and yeah. they go on for years and years. So that's exactly right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's, you know, uh, before I did, um, you know, facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, I was doing a lot of head and neck cancer mm -hmm. uh, training. And one of the things we would always talk about, everyone was so scared of surgery. I'm like, look, listen, radiation therapy is fantastic. It prevents surgery, but long-term, 
it has some collateral damage that you will be dealing with every day. So if it were- You know something, you hit the nail on the head. That's what I had. Radiation therapy. And if you listen to my voice- Yeah, no, I, I was just- you hear it. Yeah, I was <laughs> just about to, I didn't want to pry, but that's- No, no, but that's exactly what it was. Yeah. And, uh, and just to let people know, it's uh, 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 papillomavirus. Yeah. Uh, HPV. Human papal HPV related, and it's a big epidemic in guys my age. Yeah. Why? We were children of the sexual revolution. We had a great time when we were young. Yeah. We were paying for it when we were older. So yeah. I recommend that everybody, young and old, get the vaccine. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. And the vaccine, we are now doing studies to see if the vaccine can prevent late cancers. Yeah. It would be it, very interesting. It's a game changer. And that was, again, during my training, we were just at the beginning phase of understanding HPV for right. you know, head and neck cancer and so forth. But it's very different. It's very different from smoking-related cancer. Yeah. Very yeah. different. Oh, Fortunately, much better outcomes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, speaking of head and neck cancer, when I was at Dana-Farber and running the Department of Cancer Pharmacology, I worked a lot on head and neck cancer. And we were able, by doing chemotherapy first yes. for serious cases to reduce mortality from 80% to 20%. The synergistic so activity was amazing. It was really, it really worked well. Uh, it was a long, hard slog. But it's really where understanding how the cancer drug works intersected very nicely with functional therapies. And it was also, I think, the beginning phase of bringing different specialties together because for it a was. long time, hematologists, oncologists, and radiation oncologists didn't really work together. And, and don't forget the surgeons. And the surgeons, yeah, surgeons. I once had to abandon a very good drug because I couldn't get radiologists and, can, and oncologists to work together. Yeah. Okay. This drug was a radioactive uh, biotherapeutic, and we just couldn't get anybody to take it on. But now that's changed. And now there's an integration, which is very, very fortunate. It's been amazing. It's yeah, been it an amazing, is, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I spent this many years. This is a detour, but it is in your specialty and my experience. Yeah. I spent years reconstructing cancer, head and neck cancer defects. And that's yeah. the last thing. If I mean, that's, that's a major, major, major life-altering it is. So congratulations. I'm glad Thank that you're you. doing well. Okay. My last question has nothing to do with coronavirus, has nothing to do with um, any of the things that we talked about, but I'm so curious to know. This is a personal question. You were in academia for years. You were pioneering, starting departments at Harvard. Why and how did you end up deciding to move on and going on to obviously having an amazing entrepreneurial uh, career as a second career, starting biotech companies and making an impact on that side. What was the, how, just out of curiosity, what was the defining moment when you said, you know, I'd really want to go and do this, um, you know, something well, different? Thanks for that question. That's a nice question. And this is a message for younger people. Because when I was a kid, my parents, both my parents and myself were pretty ill. My mom had a lot of really terrible things. I remember as a four-year-old standing by her bed and she had septicemia creeping up her arm as a red line. And I was told that if it went up to her heart, she would die. And that was extremely upsetting, right? Then she had detached retinas when they had to take the eyeball out and sandbag her. She had two of those. And she had a, a series of other health problems. I myself had uh, endocarditis, not endocarditis, I had uh, pericarditis. So I couldn't go out and play for a long time. I was terrified of polio. So I didn't like disease. I thought, if I grow up, I'm going to fight disease. And then I, as a little older, I thought, I'll be a doctor. And then I really liked science. I thought, as an adult, I'm going to fight science through disease, fight disease through science. But my whole goal is to end human suffering from disease, end unnecessary disease suffering and death. And so... Even when I was doing my fundamental molecular biology work with Jim Watson and Walter Gilbert, really looking at genes and how they turn on, I knew I was headed to medicine. Not as a doctor, but to do, to try to, and then when 
I was a postdoc, I joined Dave Baltimore's lab because I thought, gee, we can't work with genes yet, but we can work with viruses. So I'm going to do what I did with bacteria there. Then my very first job was with Data Farber in a hospital, not an academic center, because I thought these guys are going to tell me the problems I should work on. And so I was always motivated by curing disease. Then as a scientist working at Harvard, I said, I got, you know, I listened to these guys. What do you, I went to rounds, pediatric oncology rounds. What do you know and what do you need to know? That's how I started my first department. I was still doing work on retroviruses, thinking they caused human disease, and then they came along. I was in a position to use my knowledge to help work on that problem. But I realized it wasn't just a scientific problem. It was a social problem. We needed money. We needed to destigmatize it. And we needed to have an institutional response to this disease, which was going to be with us forever. Long time. Just like cancer. So we needed to set up institutions. So I became, I had a broader construct. But through that process, I realized that you could do science, but unless you have a drug or a treatment that comes out of it, it's not going to help anybody. And who does that? Companies do that. I came from a military base. My dad was a civilian scientist who knew about companies, not me. For me, a company was somebody who showed you shoes outside the base. Okay. That was it. Okay. And I I had to learn, but I did learn. And then I said, okay, I have some ideas. And I started a bunch of companies, the professor, and then the big idea came along, which was genomics. And I realized from my work on HIV that having the information of a genome could really speed up the process of drug discovery. And I thought, if you can do it for a a virus, you do it for humans. And the idea of going from academia to full-time into business was It was the only way I could think of at a time to do it at a big enough scale so that people would understand. And I, my understanding of people is they don't believe anything unless it's tangible. Yeah. Until I say genomics is the way to find drugs. It's yeah, sure. Sure. When you find a drug based on genomics, people say, Hey, great. Okay. We'll do it. (laughs) And very quickly we did it. I was working with Bert Vogelstein, a cancer oncologist. And he came up with the, a very nice little uh, catchphrase, which is cloned by phone. You, we cut 30 years off of drug development from going from observed symptom to target for drugs. We didn't speed up the process of drug development, but we did speed up the process of going from, I want to cure this disease to having a starting point. And that was a big enough thing to get me out. But all of that time, I realized there are major inequities around the world. Yeah. And even in our own country. Of course. That health systems are actually what deliver drugs to people. Let me give you a very specific example. The Gates Foundation created something called One World Health, and I joined their board. They gave us the money to develop a drug to treat visceral leishmaniasis in India. We developed that drug, an old antibiotic, puroromycin, in India, And then the Gates Foundation found they couldn't give it to anybody because there wasn't the infrastructure in Bihar that had the problem to deliver it. That's a pretty clear example, right? So you need health systems. Health systems mean health financing. It means a whole structure. It means health policy at the highest levels and down to the local levels. So that's why I created Access Health. So my whole career has been devoted to using knowledge, to cure disease. Now, it's odd that at this sort of maybe last phase of my career, being realistic, oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, that all of the skills Smart. that I have combine to help understand this epidemic. Yeah. My skills in molecular biology, virology, medicine, biotech, drug development, health policy, government interactions, and public communication. All of those come together. So it is for me, uh, I can tell you, I get up at five in the morning, I go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm working like, if I'm not weeding, whacking bushes out here in Connecticut, I'm working on this problem. No, your passion is clearly visible. And I think you uh, have really made an impact and hopefully will help, I think, the lay community and the you know, people around the world understand what is, you know, what's really happening. And that's really knowledge is power. And 
you're providing that. So I Thank really, you. really yeah. appreciate your time. I know, I know, you know, you could have been on Bloomberg or CNN right now and you're spending your time with us. So I really, really appreciate it. And I hope we can. I appreciate your again. interest. Thank you. You know, in the future. Okay. And hopefully yeah. we'll talk hopefully about when it's all, under control. all the cures. And yeah. yes. Thank you again. And you're I welcome. hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, please leave comments or suggestions. And uh, check out uh, 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 www.covidfamilyguide.com. Or more. Amazon. Buy it on Amazon. Amazon. Fantastic. Family Guide to COVID. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, have sir. a great Thanks, rest sir. of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.